Number 11. The Beefalo What do you get when you mix some domestic cattle with a pinch of a wild bison? You get a beefalo. A beefalo is a fertile hybrid offspring of domestic cattle, the Bos Taurus and the American bison, commonly called the buffalo in the U.S. The breed was created to combine the characteristics of both animals for the production of meat. Beefalo is cattle in genetics and appearance, and the Breed Association defines a beefalo as one with 37.5% bison genetics, while animals with a higher percentage of bison genetics are called bison hybrids. The creation of the aforementioned hybrid turned out to be a stick in the wheels for the conversation efforts concerning the American bison. The hybrids are mixing with the wild populations and creating more beefaloes. It looks like this time we outplayed ourselves. Our creation turned against us and started to mess around with some of our other endeavors. Those are some cool-looking cows, though. Number 10. Zebroid A zebroid is the offspring of any cross between a zebra and any other equine, essentially a zebra hybrid. Most of the time, the father is a zebra and the zebroid is the common name for all zebra hybrids. The various hybrids are usually named using a mixture of the name of the father plus the mother. In principle, no distinction is made as to what kind of zebra is used. Examples include Zorse, Zebrul, Zonki, Zebonki, and Zoni. If you want to create some stripy fellows, just add a zebra into the mix. I must say that these animals certainly look cute. It would be fun to ride one of them, even just to see people's reactions as you pass by. They also have the greatest names. Who wouldn't want to own a Zebunky? Would you own one if you had a place to keep it? Number 9. Liger A liger is a hybrid cross between a male lion and a tiger. Therefore, the parents have the same genus but are different types. It is quite different than the similar Tiglon hybrid. The liger is the largest of all known existing cats. Just look at these creations. It weighs a lot. It's taller than you on its hind legs, and although it looks like a big kitty, just imagine the size of its claws. It is one heck of a predator. The ligers enjoy swimming, which is typical of tigers, and they are very social animals like lions. Truly, this animal has taken the best traits of both of its parents. These hybrids exist only in captivity because the habitats of the native species do not overlap in nature. History tells us that there is a chance that a creature like this may have lived in the wild in the past. It's not impossible, but without solid evidence, even the claims of that happening are considered highly improbable. Ligers in particular tend to grow more than any parental species, unlike tiglons that usually reach the size of an adult tiger female. Number 8. Wolf Dog A wolf dog, also called a wolf hybrid, is a dog hybrid result of the mating of a wolf, several species of Canis lupus, and a dog Canis lupus familiaris. Most animal and livestock advocates prefer the term wolf dog, since the pet dog has recently been taxonomically reclassified as a wolf species. The American Veterinary Association and the U.S. Department of Agriculture treat animals as hybrids of dog wolves. Rescue organizations believe that every wolf heritage dog in the last five generations is a wolf dog, including some established breeds of wolf dogs. In 1998, the USDA estimated an estimated population of 300,000 wolves in the United States, the highest in any country in the world and some other sources give a population of probably 500,000. In first-generation hybrids, gray wolves intersect with wolf dogs, such as German Shepherd Siberian Huskies and the Alaskan Malamute, for a more attractive look for owners who want to have an exotic pet. Since wolf dogs are genetic mixtures of wolves and dogs, their physical and behavioral characteristics cannot be predicted with certainty. One day, the hybrid might just snap and attack the hand that feeds it. It's a 50-50 thing. Might not, who knows? And now for number seven. But first, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on more videos like these. Number seven, Cama. Camel llama hybrids or camas are a genetic hybrid between an old world camel, drum dairy or a Bactrian camel and a new world camel, llama or alpaca. Usually these two groups could reproduce within their own groups, but have only recently been able to hybridize. The first was artificially made in 1995. Due to the difference in size between the camel and the llama, it is not impossible to allow them to mate independently. For some reason, the female camels, inseminated by male llamas, were unable to conceive. The camel has no humps and have a long, fluffy coat just like a llama. The ears of the camel are midway between the length of the camel and a llama. However, the camel acquired different legs than the camel, making them suitable for the desert. The camels also have a combination of legs, midway between the camel foot pad and the llama feet. Llamas and camels have 74 chromosomes, which means that the camma is fertile. There are still no offspring between the two camas. The camma reaches maturity in about four years and seems more interested in llamas than camels. The goal was to create an animal with the size and strength of a camel, but with a more cooperative temperament and a greater wool production of the llama. 
What do you think, guys? Did the scientists succeed in their experiment? Number 6. Wolfen Wolfen, or wolfine, is a rare hybrid born from the mating of a female bottlenose dolphin with the false male killer whale. The name suggests a hybrid of whale and dolphin, although taxonomically both are in the ocean dolphin family, which is the tooth whale subdivision. Although it has been reported that they exist in nature, there are currently only two in captivity, both in Hawaii's Sea Life Park. Walthens, although not commonly encountered by fishermen, are known in the popular marine tradition as the Great Grey Beast. These animals are almost mythological in nature. Some people claim to have seen them, but there's no firm evidence of this happening in recent years. I'm not saying that somewhere out there, a family of Walthens are not having the time of their lives, just that they might be keeping a low profile. These guys are so cute! Number 5. Roller Bear A brown grizzly polar bear hybrid, Pizzly Bear, Prizzly Bear, or Groller Bear, is a rare ursid hybrid found both in captivity and in nature. In 2006, the occurrence of this hybrid in the wild was confirmed by testing the DNA of a strange-looking bear that was shot near the port of Saks in the Canadian Arctic. Ursid hybrids, a term that refers to any hybrid of two species in the Ursidae family, include several other types of polar bear hybrids. Hybrids of polar bears with grizzly bears in nature have also been reported and filmed in the past, but DNA techniques were not available to verify the breed of the bears. This is one huge Coca-Cola mascot-looking bear. It certainly is majestic and beautiful, but scary nonetheless. The only good thing about meeting one of these hybrids in the snowy mountains would be that the rescuers would have an easier time locating a slightly reddish bear on a white background, because it would probably eat you. Number 4. Mule The mules are one of the most used working animals in the world, much appreciated for their strength and obedient nature. In countries from North America to Southeast Asia, mules tow cars to the market, transport people on difficult terrain, and help their farmers. The charity for the working animals of the world treats thousands of mules each year through their mobile centers and clinics and works with the owners to give them a better understanding and understanding of the misunderstood animals. The mule is the child of a boy donkey and a girl horse. That paints a nice picture, eh? Horses and donkeys are a different species and respectively have different numbers of chromosomes. Of two F1 hybrids between these two species, the mule is easier to obtain than Heine, the offspring of a male and a horse donkey. All males and most mules are barren. The size of the mule and the work that it does depends largely on the breeding. The mules can be light, of medium weight, or even made of draught horse mares of moderate weight. It is said that the mules have taken their best traits from both parental sides. They are faster than donkeys, but more patient than horses. All in all, a great mix that gives us an incredible animal. Number 3. Savannah Savannah cat is the name given to the offspring of a domestic cat and serval, a medium-sized wild African cat with big ears. The unusual cross became popular with breeders in the late 20th century, and in 2001, the International Cats Association accepted it as a new registered breed. Savannas are much more sociable than typical domestic cats and are often compared to dogs for their loyalty. They can be trained to walk on a leash and can even be taught to play games. You might even throw them a stick for some fetch time. Their temperament is exceptional when properly bred. Some would say that they are the dogs among cats. Ideal companions for owners who want to avoid extra dog requirements but want to have an active and attractive pet. The savannas are actively seeking social interaction. They get vexed if they are kept away from it. Deeply loyal to immediate family members, some felines may question the presence of strangers, but they heat up quickly as they are curious and desire to interact. These cats make excellent companions who are loyal, intelligent, and eager to participate. Their intelligence, as we have said, is demonstrated by the ability to learn a plethora of simple to complex commands. Number 2. Zoe A zoe is a mixture between a yak and domestic cattle. The word zoe technically refers to a male hybrid, while the female is known as a zomo or zom. Alternative romanizations of Tibetan names include zoe and zoe. In Mongolian, it is called kinang. There's also the English term yakko, a combination of the words yak and cow, although this is rarely used. Zomo are fertile, while zom are sterile. Because they are the product of the hybrid genetic phenomenon of hysterosis, hybrid vigor, they are larger and stronger than cattle or yak. In Mongolia and Tibet, they are thought to be more productive than livestock or yaks in terms of milk and meat production. Number 1. Pumapard Whether they are born of a female cougar mated to a male leopard or a male cougar mated to a female leopard, the pumapards inherit a dwarf form. These hybrids grew to only half the size of their parents. They have a long body similar to the cougar with short legs. Their fur is described as sandy, tawny, or gray with brown, brown, or discolored rosettes. 
One is preserved at the Walter Rothschild Zoological Museum in Tring, England, and clearly shows the trend towards dwarfism. So why are these things so popular? Well, this is due to the fact that, regardless of how much the puma and leopard match, the offspring obtained are almost always prone to suffer from a condition called the cat dwarfism, which is characterized by teeny tiny feet like the ones you would find on a modern day munchkin feline. This thing is cute as heck, even the name sounds like something that runs on hugs. Number 10, Meganora. Giant arthropods were first linked to higher atmospheric oxygen levels in 1880, after the first fossil of Meganora in France was discovered. These dragonfly-like creatures flew around, feeding on amphibians and other insects about 300 million years ago. With huge wings of up to 65 centimeters, they were among the largest flying insects in history ever. Thank God they were dragonflies. I don't even want to imagine them being mosquitoes. Strictly speaking, Meganoras were more of griffinflies because their bodies were a bit different from the ones of dragonflies. Insect body size is limited by the way they transport oxygen from the air to their internal organs. They have no lungs and instead use a trachealar tube system. During the Carboniferous period, 359 to 299 million years ago, up to 35% of the air was oxygen. This may have allowed Meganora to to draw more energy from the same amount of air and therefore continue to fly, even when they became huge. The theory could explain why they didn't survive in later periods when oxygen levels dropped. You would think that the more oxygen there is in the air, the easier it would be for us. You would recover faster after some physical activity, your mind will be clearer, and so on. But come to think of it, you will need all of those advantages to be able to outrun and outsmart the giant insects. Can you imagine a wasp with a wingspan of 65 centimeters? Make good use of that extra air, and as they taught us in Zombieland, don't forget to double tap. Number 9. Jacolopterus renanie. Jacolopterus renanie is the ultimate nightmare of the arachnophobic. At 2.5 meters in length, this giant sea scorpion is entitled to the title of the largest arthropod ever. Truth be told, its name is quite misleading. They were not real scorpions, and they probably hang around in lakes and rivers, not in the ocean. It lived about 390 million years ago and spent its time gobbling fish and being a badass scorpion king. I'm speculating for the scorpion king part. Chill, we're having fun, remember? It was described in 2008 after a prickly 46 centimeter claw was found at the blasting pit in Germany. That was all that remained of the animal. However, the ratio of the claw size to the body is quite constant in marine scorpions. So researchers have been able to estimate that it was 260 centimeters long. The discovery is further evidence that arthropods have been significantly larger in the past. No one is sure why these prehistoric creepy crawlies were that big. Some suggest that they owe their size to the atmosphere back in those times that contained more oxygen than it does now. Others emphasize the lack of other predators like backbone fish. Number 8. Sarcosuchus Imperator not only insects have reduced their size over the years, dinosaur hunting paleontologists in 1997 were surprised to find crocodile jawbones as long as a human. You heard that right, their mouth was big enough to swallow you whole. The paleontologists were stunned to have encountered the most complete specimen of the Sarcosuchus imperator, a prehistoric giant that hunted in the wide rivers of the tropical North Africa 110 million years ago. Also known as Super Croc, it grew to 12 meters and weighed about 8 tons. That's twice as long and four times as heavy as the largest crocodile today. He probably ate small dinosaurs. It had a narrow jaw 1.8 meters long that contained more than 100 teeth as well as vertically inclined eye sockets and a large bony protuberance at the tip of the muzzle. It would look like the critically endangered gharials from the contemporary India and Nepal. Despite its nickname, Sarcosuchus imperator was not a direct forerunner of the 23 species of modern crocodiles. It belonged to an extinct family of reptiles called philidosaurs. Other equally large crocodiles have been found, especially those of the extinct genus Dinosuchus. They were related to the modern alligators and may have reached 10 meters in length. Crocodiles could grow so much because they lived mainly in water, so they could float and carry more weight than they would be possible on land. They also had strong skulls that gave them powerful bites so that they could tackle large prey. And now for number 7. But first, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on more videos like these. Number 7. Terror Birds In recent years, scientists have been trying to use gene editing tools to resurrect extinct species such as the Pyrenean Ibex, the Tasmanian Tiger, the Passenger Pigeon, and even the Woolly Mammoth. Let's hope they never have a single terror bird DNA in their hands. Formerly known as the forest racids, they were a group of non-flying birds up to 3 meters or 10 feet high. 
they could run at 50 kilometers or 30 miles per hour and swallow a medium-sized dog with one bite. Their height and long necks would give them long reach and help them detect prey from a distance, while long and powerful legs provided the speed and acceleration needed for the engagement and elimination of the prey. The huge curved down beaks of the thunder chickens I can't make them sound cute as hard as I try, allowed them to bite chunks off their targets like most modern-day birds of prey do. Most of the forest rats' fossils were found in South America, where they lived about 60 and 2 million years ago. Some remains have also been found in North America. It was once claimed that these birds had survived until 10,000 years ago, according to discoveries in Florida, but these fossils turned out to be much older than they previously thought. Their closest living relatives are thought to be South American seriemas. They only reach 80 centimeters in height. Number 6. Megatherium What would a hamster the size of an elephant mixed with a bear look like? Quite strange and maybe a little like a megatherium. This genus included the largest of the giant land-based vacationers who lived predominantly in South America from 5 million to 11,000 years ago. While they were not as large as dinosaurs or woolly mammoths, these impressive beasts were still among the largest land animals. They were up to 6 meters or 20 feet long. They were part of a group that included the lazy armadillo and the modern vestibules. The megatheriums had extremely long skeletons they were obviously built for strength and stability, but for better or worse, not for speed. They also had long arms and sharp, elongated nails. Most scientists believe that they used them to reach trees and grab leaves and bark that were out of reach to smaller animals. Megatherium americanum is thought to have eaten meat. The shapes of the elbow bones suggest that they can move their hands quickly, which could allow them to jab at their prey of choice. They were kind of like gigantic prehistoric boxers. Their hands were not as fast, but one hit and it was all it took for them to knock their victims out. Number 5. Metaposerus Metaposerus fossils have been found in Germany, Poland, North America, Africa, and India. Prehistoric fish were not having the time of their lives. Earth was also home to giant carnivorous amphibians that resembled huge salamanders. Most species were destroyed during the mass extinction that took place around 201 million years ago. This event destroyed many boneless animals, including large amphibians, and left the field open to dominate the dinosaurs. The newest species was described in March 2015 by Stephen Brusa of the University of Eden in the United Kingdom and his colleagues. They named it Metaposerus algarvensis in honor of the region of Portugal where they were found. It was two meters long and had a wide, flat head that resembled a toilet seat, although it contained hundreds of teeth. We could say that it was quite the fearsome toilet seat. The smaller and weaker members had to spend time on land. The Metaposerus was the forerunner of all modern amphibians such as frogs and newts. Despite its appearance, it was only remotely associated with today's salamanders. This is one strange-looking creature, kind of looks like like a mix between a crocodile and a small hippo. Whatever it might look like to you, we can be sure that it wasn't friendly at all. One look at its teeth would discourage any thought of it being pet material, even if it appears quite cartoony. Number 4. Megalodon Sharks you may have heard reports that there are massive sharks that roam the oceans three times bigger than the Great White and 30 times heavier. Chill, they're long gone. Or so we think. They were called Megalodon, and no one is sure how big they were. Like all sharks, their skeleton was made of cartilage, not bone, so it wasn't able to fossilize. As a result, we only have teeth and a few vertebrae to go on. Recent estimates put it 16 to 20 meters, or 52 to 65 feet long. This is significantly larger than the largest living fish today. Whale sharks reach only 12.6 meters, or 41 feet. Megalodon's giant jaws contained more than 200 serrated teeth, each up to 18 centimeters, or 7 inches. It could bite with the insane force of 11 to 18 tons, four to six times more powerful than that of the T-Rex. Scientists believe that the Megalodon lived from 16 to 2.7 million years ago. Afterward, huge whales took its place as the largest animals in the ocean, according to a 2014 study. Number 3. Arthropleura The largest arthropod in history was the Arthropleura, a genre of millipedes up to 2.6 meters long. They lived around 340 million years ago and may also have benefited from the highest levels of oxygen the air contained in those times. No one has yet found a complete fossil. Partial debris 90 centimeters or 3 feet long was found in southwestern Germany, and the remains that have been attributed to them were found in Scotland, USA, and Canada. It seems that the bodies of the Arthropleura were formed of about 30 articulated segments covered with side plates and a central plate. As the remains of the Arthropleura's mouth were never found, it is difficult to say for sure what they ate. 
Researchers examining the fossils have found fern spores that suggested that their diet consisted almost in its entirely of plants and other members of the floral world. Arthur Plura has proved popular with filmmakers and has taken part in several BBC's popular science films. And I totally get it. This thing rocks on screen. Add some radiation into the mix and it wouldn't take long before you end up with Toho's next creation that will fill the ranks of the crazy looking Godzilla enemies. It might even be an ally. One of the good guys. Who knows? Step away from the limelight, Mothra. Destructipede is here. Number 2. Titanoboa sargenensis About 60 million years ago, shortly after the extinction of dinosaurs, one brave species snake was able to evolve twice the length of the longest modern snake. Titanoboa sargenensis was 14.6 meters or 48 feet long and weighed more than a ton. It was described in 2009 after fossilized vertebrae and skulls were discovered in a coal mine in Colombia. Considered to be a distant relative of the anaconda and boa constrictor, it crushed its prey to death. Its victims may have included even crocodiles. Snakes depend on the outside heat to survive, as they cannot regulate their own body temperature. The titanoboa could only reach its large size because the Earth was warmer when it did its whole evolution thingy. A replica of the life-size slippery monster is on display at the Smithsonian's Institution's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. since 2012. If you're afraid of snakes, you should definitely stay away from the exhibit. I don't have a fear of snakes, and just the thought of this one still makes me uneasy. Number 10. Agarosis benmulai What would the baby of a whale and a lobster look like? If such a thing was possible, it would definitely look like an Agarosis benmulai. Reaching 2 meters long, it lived about 480 million years ago and belonged to an extinct family of marine animals called Anomalocarids. The alien-looking creature had grid-shaped sieves attached to appendages situated on its head that filtered plankton from seawater so the animal can eat and feast on once the plankton nets did their job. It was living at a time when plankton was becoming more and more diverse, which allowed it to adapt to a lifestyle that was quite different from most of the Anomalocarids, which were predators with sharp teeth. This strange creature could help uncover how the limbs of arthropods, that is, spiders, insects, and modern crustaceans develop. According to previous, less complete fossils of remnant creatures, an anomalocarid was thought to have only one pair of flaps for swimming per segment of the body. However, Agarosis benmulai, even to the untrained eye, had two pairs per segment. In an article published in Nature in March 2015, researchers showed that the twin flaps of the creature corresponded to the upper and lower segments of the modern arthropod limbs. They reviewed other fossils of the anomalocarid and found that they also had a twin pair of flaps. They concluded that in some species, evolutionary pressure caused the fins to fuse together. This suggests that the anomalocarid was an early arthropod. This has been in doubt for a long time, thanks to these crazy-looking bodies. Until 1985, paleontologists believed that their prickly appendages were shrimp bodies, their jagged mouths were jellyfish, and the bodies sea cucumbers. Number 10. Skipper's Canyon Road in New Zealand Skipper's Canyon Road is not only one of the most dangerous roads on the planet, but also one of the scariest. Imagine driving your car on a gravelly path, with stones and pebbles hitting the bottom of your car, striking it with such force that you might think you are getting showered by angry medieval catapults. Then you would have to cross 16.5 miles of very narrow roads, barely large enough to fit a car, let alone two vehicles coming from opposite directions. And if you meet one coming from the other direction, the only way to continue would be to go back out about a mile and a half just to find a wide enough place to let the other car pass. And that is the drop that overflows the cup of anger that you have accumulated toward this road. Then you realize that the road was cut by miners with their own hands about 140 years ago during the 1880 gold rush. And weirdly enough, after a couple of seconds, you are humbled by an invisible force. Finally, do not look down if you think that you will have a problem with several hundred feet of a vertical drop, as the bottom will definitely make you dizzy. But that is not all, folks. Mother Nature has done her best to make sure that if you fall down the jagged rocks on the way down in this part of the South Island of New Zealand would make it very hard for painters to transfer your image on a canvas. The views are great, and they make the whole trip worth all the tension and fear that goes through your veins. Number 9. North Youngest Road, or El Camino de la Muerta in Bolivia. They call it the Way of Destiny, or more properly, the Way of Death. It is more than 35 miles and extends from La Paz to Caraco. It is estimated that between 200 and 300 travelers are losing their lives along this infamous road. These are reportable deaths and the actual number can be higher than that. If you have a nerve to cross this famous passage, 
you will see several cross marks on certain sections of the road, marking where cars, trucks, and other vehicles have made their last leap. Your first challenge would be climbing the 15,260 feet to La Cumbre Pass. This is a slow climb as the steep incline of the road will generally push the limits even of the toughest engines on Earth. Then there is a 3,900 foot descent, which is a favorite stretch for reckless cyclists and mountain bikers, and it leads straight to Curaco. Do not dare cross the path of death during the rainy season, because the stretch is high in the mountains and visibility can be hindered by both rain and fog. The road can become so muddy and slippery that it becomes a source of danger in itself. In the summer, vehicle dust and the risk of rocks falling are the number one enemy for all passers-by. Number 8. Sojila in India Don't make the mistake of calling this Zojila Pass as you would be calling it Zoji Pass Pass, since La is already the Himalayan word for pass. It may only be 5.6 miles long, but Zojila can be very difficult to cross. Extending at an altitude of 11,575 feet above sea level in one of the sections of the equally famous Himalayan mountain range, the Zodi Pass connects Ahmed Lek to the Srinagar in Jammu and Kashmir in India. Therefore, you can imagine its economic importance in the area. You cannot go through Zojila in the winter as it is practically impassable. Compared to other roads on this list, Zojila is several inches wider though it still requires nerves of steel to drive on. Your confidence in your driving skills is the key to successfully passing the transition. Your best bet for a vehicle would be a four-wheel drive one, as there are many irregular surfaces in certain sections of the road. If it rains, the road can be especially tricky, even for four-wheel monsters. The drops are also quite steep, and there are no railings to prevent driving enthusiasts from falling to their doom. Whatever you do, do not look out the window, as this can be particularly disorienting. However, the view can be quite impressive. Unfortunately, looking at the breathtaking views of the highest peaks on the Earth can be the reason for your fall into the abyss a few thousand feet below. And now for number seven. But first, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on more videos like these. Number seven, James Dalton Highway in Alaska. There is a reason why Alaska is known as the last frontier of the United States. If you manage to drive the entire 414 miles of the James Dalton Highway without jumping from your seat while doing it, you can drive anywhere. Unlike other dangerous roads on the planet, there are no rocky cliffs that can immediately spell your doom along the former Alaska Road 11. There are no rocks, mudslides, or even landslides. In fact, there are no vertical rock faces to look at as you drive hundreds of miles. So what's the problem? Boredom. And the feeling of being so isolated from the rest of the world. This stretch of gravel road is called the loneliest road on earth. If you decide to try the most isolated route in the world, you will need to go through an intensive survival course, as staying on the road with huge trucks hauling big loads definitely tests your reflexes. The rule for driving is simple. You see a big truck coming at you, you move out of the way as soon as you can. Number six, Svalboger Road in Iceland. Also known as Route 622, Svalboger Road is a 13.6 mile pass between Loken Hamrar and Pengairi, giving a very dramatic view of the Arnof Jordur and the Dairaf Jordur Fords. Try to say those. The rough gravel provides a road that only four-wheel drive cars with extremely high ground clearances can pass. You'll have to navigate to and below magnificent cliffs with irregular edges a few inches from your head. Reaching the southern part of the road requires some planning because you should wait for low tide. Incorrectly calculating your speed simply means waiting several hours to see the tide withdrawal from the shore. Do not pray for rain when leaving to navigate this road, as even the most experienced drivers have been tested by it and many have failed. The lower parts of the road simply disappear from the face of the earth during winter storms. You will also have to cope with the landslides, heavy snowfall, and avalanches. There are many things that can go wrong and usually do. The road itself is unusually narrow, often covered with rocks as large as Ottoman. There are also rocks that are hanging dangerously above the passing vehicles, just waiting for their cue to wreak havoc. But here's the thing, if you manage to conquer the road yourself, good for you. Only a few people can pull off something like that on their first try. Number five, Abano Pass in Georgia. How fast can you go through a 52 kilometer stretch of road? In less than an hour, right? 
Well, if you try Albano Pass into Shetty, Georgia, it will take you 12 hours or maybe even more. This passage is located right in the heart of Caucasus, about 9,350 feet above sea level. Although it is not the most manageable route in this mountain range, only 4x4 vehicles can literally complete this journey. Conditions can change in the blink of an eye, often even faster. It links to Tusheti in the North Kaheti in the South. Crossing Albano is only allowed in the summer. In addition, frequent changes in the weather can happen at any time. And if you drive the stretch, the authorities decide to close it. Sit down and pray to God of landslides, rocks, and avalanches for mercy and forgiveness. There are parts of Albano that are quite far away, so you are expected to prepare well in advance. However, do not make the mistake of overstuffing your belly with food before you start your climb, as the winding road at high altitude has the tendency to make people lose their lunches. Remember, this is one of the highest roads. Number 4. Fairy Meadow Roads in Pakistan Don't let this stretch of 10-mile dirt road fool you. It may give you a very impressive view of the side of Pakistan. A look away from the road and you will see a fall of several thousand feet. Fairy Meadows Road has been consistently identified as one of the most dangerous roads in the world, and it's easy to see why. Continuing on down the highway, another deadly passage that crosses the heart of the Gilgit Balistan area and ends at Tato, Fairy Tale Meadows combines the dangers of oxygen free breathing, a completely pristine gravel peak, and a very unstable rock face waiting to collapse. Although the 10 kilometers of death that are considered safe by Pakistani standards, the point of the six-mile climb where vehicles are literally moving at a snail's pace is more tricky. You are a wrong move away from the base of jumping off the Eiffel Tower. A small contraction of the arm muscles can send a vehicle on the express elevator to the bottom of the valley. Unfortunately, what will greet you are the jagged edges of rocks and boulders larger than a London double-decker bus. There are no barriers to stop your dive. There are no lights except the flickering of distant stars, which are often obscured by the clouds in the region. No one dares to drive on the Ferry Meadows Road at night. Only a Jeep Wrangler can make its way through. The only safe time for drivers in the area to drive is wintertime because the road is closed. Number 3. Gualiang Tunnel Road in China The Gualiang Tunnel is only three quarters of a kilometer long, but it is considered the most treacherous three quarters you can drive on. Gualiang is a hand-carved road using only chisels and primitive hammers. Thirteen villagers from the small town of Gu Aliang dug a tunnel through Ta Heng in an attempt to connect their village to the rest of the world. At the end of 1977, when it was finished, it became an instant success. You don't often see a tunnel carved into a mountainside by hand tools only. It is 13 feet wide and 16 feet tall. The tunnel road remains one of the most dangerous roads in existence, as even the slightest mistake can prove disastrous not only for you, but also for the many tourists who walk through the man-made tunnel. Number 2. Taroko Gorge Road in Taiwan If you have vertigo or fear of landslides, then don't dare to drive this road in Taiwan. You will miss this picturesque mountain landscape of this region, which connects the eastern and western coasts of the small island nation off the coast of China. While the road itself is made by the most advanced tunneling technology in this part of the world, the very nature of the gorge makes it one of the most dangerous worlds. There are barriers all over, except that there are numerous blind turns, narrow roads, and tight turns that require a zen approach to driving if you want to get to the Taiwan shores alive. What makes it quite complicated is that you have buses, cars, scooters, and pedestrians competing for the narrow road. And if you are familiar with Taiwan, you know that this is the way of Asian storm systems. It is also part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, an area prone to earthquakes around the Pacific Ocean. Now add landslides and rock slides to the mix and you'll find out why it's one of the most treacherous, though superbly constructed roads on the planet. Number 1. Karel Karam Highway from Pakistan to China Have you ever heard of the Karakoram Highway? This 800-mile stretch that connects China to Pakistan is known as the toughest alpine climb on the planet. It is a mixture of paved and unpaved roads, the first being only on the Chinese side of the section. It follows the backbone of the Karakoram mountain range and crosses the Kunara Pass. Completing the road required 27 years and 892 fatalities. The Karakoram Highway is also considered to be one of the scariest roads to drive on. The road itself, especially along the 551-mile Pakistani Trail, can test your stamina, as well as the power of handling that you have over your car. 
with hundreds of turns, mostly one or two wheels, hanging precariously just above the cliff, only the toughest drivers dared to confront the mighty Karakoram. There are avalanches, landslides, and heavy snowfall, and because it is at the top of a mountain range, it is definitely not for the people with intense altitude fears or altitude sickness. On one side of the road is the face of Karakoram, often with sharp rocks protruding from the rock wall like metal spikes of an armored plate. On the other side of the road, there is a clear vertical fall, often covered by low clouds. And without the protection of the railings, their margin of error is quite small. Of course, you can be amazed at the magnificence of the views, but make no mistake, Karakoram kills, especially those who do not pay attention to its harsh features. This road is classified as dangerous for various reasons. Only the most rigorous and mentally trained drivers dare to tempt fate by driving on it, and luckily for some of them, live to tell the tale. Thanks for watching. Which of these roads would you like to try your luck on? Have you got any advice to the people that want to attempt to conquer some of these roads? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.